name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Glory be 
God, we beseech thee, show thy mercy unto thy humble servants, that we who put no trust in our own merits may not be dealt with after the severity of thy judgment, but according to thy mercy, through Jesus Christ thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost ever one God world without end. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament lesson appointed for reading on this Sunday is recorded for us in the prophecy given through St. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 12 through 17. The Lord prophesied through Isaiah, saying, Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west, and these from the land of Sinan. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your sons shall make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste shall go away from you. Here ends the lesson. We chant together in unison uh, Psalm 116 as printed in the bulletin. Yes, our God is merciful. 
said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the of all his people. Precious is the sight of the Lord, is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the The Holy Epistle appointed for this day is recorded for us in St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet our Lord in the air. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Here ends the Holy Epistle. delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, my feet from falling. I love the Lord, because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. Alleluia, alleluia, with thee is the fountain of Please arise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning in chapter 24 at the 15th verse. At 
that time, Jesus taught his disciples saying, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world or until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Here ends the Holy Gospel. We confess our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed at the top of page 12 in the front of the hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat>
dear fellow redeemed by the blood of the spotless Lamb of God, upon whom has come the end of the age. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The words that guide our meditation this morning are the words of the gospel lesson that you have just heard. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, make us holy in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Oh. Lightning and carcasses and lions and tigers and bears, oh my! When you refer to the prophecy in the end of Daniel and you read those things, wow, is this not the making for all sorts of fantastic ideas? And every now and then we still receive the card in the mail which promises to reveal the secrets of revelation. If you'll just come and listen to the fantasies of whoever happens to be presenting on that dedicated day. And they will go through all of these things and all of the numbers of the days that are recorded. And they're going to tell you that we, we can know. We can know when it's going to happen. And when this little war breaks out here or that famine there or that tsunami in this other place, you see that fits exactly in this timeline on this day according to this thing and that thing and spin this thing around five times and dump it upside down. And there you have it. Now we know. Only Jesus said nobody knows the day and the hour. And quite humorously, there are those that say, yes, we don't know the day and the hour, but we can at least know the year. Or not. Or not. Daniel, when he was told about this abomination that causes desolation and the ending of the regular sacrifice and how long it would be and all of that, Daniel was extremely troubled. And in that prophecy, it was revealed that Michael, Michael, his name, that one named archangel in the canonical scriptures, there's several others uh, mentioned in the Apocrypha, but in the canonical scriptures, Michael, his name means, who is like God? Okay, little delightful, little rhetorical question. Who is like God? That prince of God's people would rise up and fight for God's people and help them. Um, Daniel was very troubled. And he was told, relax, close the book. It is sealed. The understanding of it is sealed until the days of the very end. So when the apostles came to Jesus and said, you know, you told us these things are going to happen and you're going to come back and all of that. When? When's it going to be? And then Jesus started into this sort of thing. And so when he told them about the abomination that causes desolation, when you see it standing in the holy place, and Jesus did not use either of the words that would normally be used for a temple. This refers to a holy place. When he told them this, he was indicating to them that they were at the very doorstep of the fulfillment of the very end times. Very interesting things we read in what Jesus said. He talked about, um, well, first of all, when, when you see that abomination that causes desolation. We have it translated, let the reader understand. And the, the word there is one who would read publicly these words and let him understand. It's maybe better, let him consider, let him contemplate, okay? What is it that when we see the abomination that causes desolation, what things should come to mind? And we're at the end. We're at the end of the age. This, this is it. There's not really much more to come. Okay? Let that be contemplated. And then Jesus talks about lightning, and we, we remember how Satan 
Jesus said he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning and people who you know whether they're sincere in it or don't really realize what they're doing they like to use a symbol of lightning for Satan and they misunderstand the words they kind of have the idea that Jesus had said, I saw Satan shoot down from heaven like lightning, as if the concept was that he hit the earth with all of this power. No. He didn't shoot down from heaven by his own will. He fell like lightning. So when Jesus used those words in regard to the devil, he was not focused on the incredible power that is in lightning. There is a lot of power there. But he was focusing on how instantaneous lightning is. I, I grew up in the Midwest where, you know, I mean, living in Hillsboro, Oregon, there's just not much lightning. These images kind of for us are like, huh? Okay, um, growing, growing up in the Midwest, I saw a lot of lightning between clouds and from the sky to the earth. I worked with a man who uh, grew up in Louisiana and Florida and he had, he had never seen lightning go from one cloud to another and then living in Georgia, he commented at work one day, you know what I saw the other day? I saw lightning go from one cloud to the other and I was kind of like, really? Okay. That's like normal, isn't it? Not for him. So the image is, you have to wrap your mind around the image as it would be when it was originally spoken to the people to whom Jesus was speaking. Lightning, it's very instantaneous. It flashes from the east to the west, from cloud to cloud, just boom, boom, there it is. Instantaneous, you don't mark a bunch of time for that lightning to start here, oh yeah, there it is, and there it's coming, there's, no, it's boom, boom, there it is. Jesus is telling us when he returns, it is going to be so instantaneous and so shocking, and if you've been in storms like that, and you found yourself outside, it, it's very surprising and very unnerving because the lightning's there, and then it's there, and it's totally unexpected and very, very sudden. And truly, that's what he's getting at here. His return is going to be completely unexpected and very, very, very sudden. So he warns us. He warned his apostles. The time was coming when you would see the abomination that causes desolation, the, the idol, if you will, that thing that is objectionable to God, which causes depopulation, which causes death, desolation. And it would be standing in the holy place, not necessarily the temple. Now the commentators struggle with this a little bit because there's so many prophecies that seem to begin in one place and then shift to another, and this is undoubtedly one of those. So we can look at this in a very physical, civil kind of way, and we can look at it in a spiritual way as well. Jesus mentions the eagles gathering on the carcass. You know, we think of the eagles as this majestic bird that soars high and, and it is tough and valiant and ferocious. Um, it's a carrion bird, that, that is, it, it feeds mostly on dead animals animals and if we were to substitute vultures in place of eagles this passage might make a little more sense to us might be more easy to understand wherever the roadkill is there the vultures will gather look at what Jesus was saying in the gospel lesson false prophets and false Christ are going to arise in the day when you see that abomination that causes desolation and you flee and flee quickly and it's going to be so bad at that time like nobody has ever seen before pray that that day when it comes it's not going to be during the winter because the suffering is going to be so bad, and if it's at that time or on a Sabbath, it's going to be that much 
more difficult to handle because it's going to be very, very bad. Okay? False Christs and false prophets will arise. Don't follow them, Jesus said. And so the end of our reading where Jesus refers to us, the eagles gathering on the carcass, where the dead church is, where there is no life of faith, real life-giving faith, there the vultures will gather. Whether it's a vulture or an eagle, carrion birds do not feast on that which is alive. And as majestic as we think an eagle is, if you're walking down the road, the eagle might soar overhead and look at you, but it is not coming to attack you. Okay? In fact, it is quite afraid of you. If you walk up to it while it is feeding on a dead carcass, it's going to fly away no matter how majestic you think that bird is. It doesn't want that which is alive. But if you're dead, if you have no faith in you, then they're going to come around and they're going to feast on you. The warning is that if the church has lost its lifeblood, its faith, its Savior, the Holy Spirit that gives life, the body and blood of Christ and the forgiveness of sins, if that is lost, then it's dead and the vultures will feast on it. And if you're paying attention in the world today, you see a lot of these vultures feasting on the dead carcasses of what used to be faithful churches, but they lost their focus and died, and there were the vultures, okay? And the prophecy that Jesus said, you know, the things like the inner rooms are out in the desert, don't believe it, there are very concrete fulfillment of these prophecies in our world today. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the official name of them is the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York. Incorporated, because, well, it's a nonprofit, so it's incorporated. Um, they actually teach, if you read their doctrines, their teachings. They actually teach that Jesus returned secretly in 1914 and is ruling through the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York, it, ruling secretly in the inner rooms. That is to say, they are saying he is here in the secret rooms. And Jesus said what? Don't believe them. Or the Mormons who came along officially called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Their, their Jesus and their Christ is something not known in the scriptures, mind you, but nevertheless, that's what they call themselves. They, they claim that he is in the deserts of Deseret and Utah and all those places, and they want you to come out and see him. He is ruling through his prophet today, his living prophet, so they claim. And Jesus said what? Don't go out there. You have no time for that. See, I have warned you. These carrion birds, these vultures, only gather where it's a dead body. Take note of it and just stay away. And insofar as you are given an opportunity to chase the vultures away, by all means, but do not become a part of the carcass that the vultures should feed on you. You have the spirit of life. Don't let that go. So what about this abomination that causes desolation, causes emptiness and depopulation? Well, in the, in the civil realm, it seems quite clear that Jesus was pointing his disciples to the destruction of Jerusalem. When interestingly enough, when the Roman standards were set up, it, you know, they had eagles there. And so they surround Jerusalem and they start planting their standards and there are the eagles in the holy place. This is God's chosen land for his people and his holy city. 
And you know, when, when you see that happening, get out of town, get out of town fast because you're gonna be closed off and the suffering will be horrific. And most of us are not very aware of this suffering. It used to be 100 years ago or so that along with the Holy Bible, and the Book of Concord, or at, or at a minimum, the large catechism, which we read all of these things very faithfully. The third book that was typically in the Lutheran library and the typical Christian library, maybe didn't have the Book of Concord, but it, then the second book would have been this book. Um, the writings of Josephus, who interestingly enough, was an unbeliever. He was a Jew who was very cozy with the Romans, and he recorded what took place during the destruction of Jerusalem and just how bad it was. And you can go and you can read it. It was, it was horrific. And for the sake of the elect, it was cut short because nobody was going to survive in Jerusalem, nobody at all, unless those days were cut short. And as the faithful fled the town and they went across the Jordan River, Josephus records that were, there were a whole bunch of people that started stepping up and saying, hey, I'm the promised Messiah, or hey, I'm, I'm the prophet that was to come. Josephus, an unbeliever, records a very concrete fulfillment of Jesus' words here. The fact of the matter is, since that day, we have had no shortage of false prophets and false Christs. The latest thing that I'm aware of in the news, and you should really look this one up because it's, on the one hand, really quite laughable, and on the other hand, really disturbing. Remember the Moonies? <coughs> Excuse me, this, the Reverend Sun Young Moon? He claimed to be the better Messiah, the one who came to complete what Jesus didn't get to finish, because after all, Jesus got crucified. And he didn't get to produce all kinds of children in this world, is what Reverend Sun Moon claimed. Well, he's dead and gone. But one of his sons now is, uh, is out there performing weddings and embracing gold plated semi, well, at least I hope they're semi-automatic rifles. Um, really quite astonishing. Or you think of the Reverend Jimmy Jones or David Koresh or any number of others. There is no shortage for the false prophets. And so Dr. Luther's take on the abomination that causes desolation was a very spiritual one. He believed that the idol that depopulated God's kingdom was the abomination of the mass where, where the Lord's Supper was turned around from Jesus' sacrifice for us and God's gift to us to being a sacrifice that the priest made now again and again and again and was offered to God now by our doing this thing. Now mind you, if you look at things very carefully, there are a lot of ways in which the Lord's Supper is a sacrifice on our part. That, that is true. There are many, many, many different ways in which it is a sacrifice on our part. The very gathering together is a sacrifice of our time for the sake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the, the elements, the bread and the wine, is a sacrifice on our part because we, we buy it in one way or, or another. And our prayers are a sacrifice to God. Sure, sure, all, all of these things, yeah, that's all true. But as far as being a sacrifice that satisfies God's wrath over sin, that was done once by our Savior Jesus once and only once and can never be done again. And if you study the sacrifices of the Old Testament, all of those sacrifices, part of the animal was burnt up and the blood poured out and the people would feast on the remaining parts. And so it is that that feast continues today when by the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus' command and his words of promise, Mere bread and wine is consecrated at his direction, and he tells us that that bread and wine is very unique in that there, that bread and wine is, in fact, his body and his blood, which now 
is given to us. It's not a sacrifice that we are making for sin. We are being united to that once for all sacrifice for sin when we gather together at his calling and do according to his command and promise and receive the gift that God so desires to give to us. But the sacrifice of the Mass, the Roman Catholic teaching on the sacrament, is such that it is a constant re-sacrificing of Christ by the priest, a work of man, to make God appeased over our sin. And Luther looked at that and said, that depopulates the church because even if you are inside of the building we call church because this is where the church gathers, yet you can be an absolute hypocrite and not part of the body of Christ when you are looking to that which man does to appease God rather than looking to what Christ the God-man has done to appease God. And there's always subtleties in these things, and so it is that now today, the subtlety is that we are mystically transported to the foot of the cross, and you gotta listen to the words that follow when they talk about it in this way today, where our prayers and the prayers of the priest and the action of the priest combine with the prayers of Mary, the mother of our Lord, and all of the saints in the once for all sacrifice. Um, okay. Jesus alone did what you and I, even all of us together, could not do. Our prayers did not combine with his sacrifice to appease God's wrath over sin. His holy life, his innocent death, his being infinite as God and under the law as man. That alone achieved the sacrifice. And the fact of the matter is, when we feast on Christ today, you will remain here in Hillsboro, Oregon, roughly you know, a third of the way around the world from where Jesus died and nearly 2,000 years after the fact you aren't going anywhere. You are quite finite, quite limited. It is Jesus, the God-man, who is able to bring that sacrifice to us here today because he is outside of time and the material world and can be where he says he is going to be when and where he decides he's going to be. So don't be drawn astray by these things. So Luther saw that as, as a very spiritual, very concrete fulfillment of the abomination that causes desolation. And what followed on the heels of the effort to reform the church and get it back on track, raise it from the dead, if you will. Um, what followed on that was the Thirty Years' War, where Europe was devastated with bloodshed and martyrdom very, very, very ferociously. And what came finally in 1648 was a very divided world after that, such that today we can't really speak of Christendom as such like we could prior to that time. That, on the one hand, is a great loss. But on the other hand, Remember what your Savior indicates. He is coming quickly, and he will come suddenly. Be aware of the time in which you live. When you read the words of Jesus' prophecy, and he reminds you of the prophecy given to Daniel, and you go back and you read those final chapters of Daniel, look at what it says there. Understand that you are now living in the time of the very end of the age. The fulfillment of all the prophecy is there such that Jesus can return right now. Not, not tomorrow. He can return at this moment, at any moment. So what do you do with that? Well, I suppose on the one hand, the time to repent is now. 
On the other hand is don't get too overly caught up in the affairs of this world. Yes, you are to cast your vote in a very careful, godly manner for those whom you think can lead your country the best, and you should promote what is good. But use your time now to reach out to the people God has placed around you. Certainly pray for your civil leaders and your nation and the people around you, and especially your family. Repent of your own sins constantly and walk clothed in the righteousness of your Savior, which is given to you in those beautiful words. I forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When you hear those words, you are clothed with the righteousness, the holiness of Christ, because your sin is forgiven. It's, it's gone. It's off the table. It's scribbled out in the account book. It's not there. You are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Walk in that way and know that as you see these things going on and that you see on TV or here on the radio or in the videos or your neighbor or whatever, all of these vultures that want to draw you away from Christ want to actually consume you. Know that Jesus warned you about them. Know that as long as you are alive, you will be safe. And when the going gets really, really tough and it seems like it is absolutely hopeless and who knows where our country is going, a lot of things don't look particularly good right now. But do remember this, not when you read in Daniel about these numbers of days that you think that you can calculate the very day that Christ is returning, but the image is this, it's half the time already. And Jesus is only expecting you to hang on just a little bit longer. You're almost there. Don't lose it now. No matter what God has for you to go through, and sometimes the things that God brings us through for the sake of his bigger picture that others may be brought to faith through this or that thing and you can go back in the scriptures and you'll see the witness of these things okay whatever God is up to and whatever you must endure because of it it's only a little while it's a very brief time Jesus will come he will come suddenly and at that point it's all done you're home free and you will rejoice for eternity Know that he is not going to let you fall. He tells you, for the sake of his chosen ones, for the sake of you, and for the sake of me, that time is cut short, that time of extreme suffering, so that you will stand as his holy ones when he returns. Get ready. The end is near. But when you hear the end is near, don't let that be disturbing. Let that be absolutely exciting. We're almost there. Our Savior, who won forgiveness of all of our sins, is about to return to take us to be with him, really, to come to us, to be with us forever. Amen. Please arise for the blessing. And now the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
almighty and everlasting God, who art worthy to be had in reverence by all the children of men. We give thee most humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, which without any merit or worthiness on our part, thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee, especially that thou hast preserved unto us in their purity, thy saving word and the sacred ordinances of thy house. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace and to grant unto thy holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors who shall preach thy word with power and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send forth laborers into thy harvest and open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy, remember the enemies of thy church and grant unto them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger. May we, in communion with thy church and in brotherly unity with all our fellow Christians, fight the good fight of faith and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth, especially do we entreat thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. To this end, we commend to thy care all our schools and pray thee to make them nurseries of useful knowledge and Christian virtues, that they may bring forth the wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamities by fire and water, war and pestilence, scarcity and famine. Protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling and cause all useful arts to flourish among us. Be thou the God and father of the widow and the fatherless children, the helper of the sick and the needy and the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Accept, we beseech thee, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. And as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work thou hast given us to do while it is day, before the night cometh when no man can work. And when our last hour shall come, support us by thy power and receive us into thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. The Lord be with you. the Lord. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.